Can yeah. You turn your TV off in the background. Can I what? Turn your TV off in the background. Oh shoot! That's right. I got kind of an <laughs> echo of my voice. Uh, I don't hear it. Okay, good. So let me go ahead and start this. I already hit the recording. Um, good evening, everyone, to another edition of the uh, uh, the Bigfoot from the field blab that we do for the Jebbing Research Group. Uh, we got a couple of things. Of course, we're going to talk to Jeremiah tonight about uh, some really big stuff that was going on with his team in, in New York there. <clears throat> but I first want to mention uh, our team leader, Nathan Rio, in Utah just a day or two ago had found uh, another group of Sasquatches, and he said they had tracks from eight distinct individuals, five trackways, and Nathan, correct me, I know you're listening, uh, if it was, what was it, 44 tracks total or 44 good tracks that you photographed? But wow. anyway, that's that's exciting news um, and really glad that he was able to. Okay, he says 44 good tracks. Okay, uh, so that, now, that's well, a great find. Would that be, is that the same same group that he ran into that night? He says he thinks I it's a different here? group. It's no, a different one, okay. It's a different group, yeah. So before we get going, I guess now a lot of people probably aren't as familiar with how things are in your part of the country, Nathan, or Nathan, uh, Jeremiah, I'm still <laughs> thinking on those tracks, uh, because I, I got pretty fired up. Those are great tracks, Nathan. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. Um, so Jeremiah, you know, everybody thinks New York, they think New York City, which is in the very southern part of the state. You guys are on the opposite side of the state, the northern part up by... The main border is that right? That's correct. Up, uh, we're an hour south of Montreal. So that's that's a lot of forest, a lot of country up there, <laughs> a lot of open country. People um, have no idea. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> go ahead. Start off, I guess, by uh, now. You'd been planning on going back into that area where we had had the encounters. November, wasn't it? Yes. When no, that that that's a different area. Well. What's a different um, area? Yes, the one the night I called you and you gave Nathan and I the specific directions. That's actually in a state forest. Okay. So okay. that is in. Uh, that's about eighteen miles away. Okay. And that that's what I was telling you today. I don't know. That could be the same group. You know, uh, we have we've had. One reports in between those two areas for years one person around this time right, of year they start and i'm sorry i can't, I can't read okay What's i can't that? read the email i, I broke my oh. glasses early, so i can't re hardly read this question but it says uh the andriandock park is 6.1 million acres the that's largest correct. in the lower 48 states so that's a lot of country folks Massive. Uh, that's huge <clears throat> so for there to be these creatures in there and then of course going into canada absolutely Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you more than likely have all three types, uh, types one, two, and four in there for sure. Uh, yes. The threes we don't know about unless we get a lot of reports from those. So anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And uh, so tell us what prompted you to go into that particular area and then, you know, kind of go through the events as they unfolded. Okay. Well, earlier that day, I got a call from a buddy. His family owns a massive uh, tree farm. They wholesale you know, all over the country. Um, they've got a massive piece of property, 800 some acres. They've been getting activity on the area in the land for years. Um, you're talking 60 years back when they first settled the uh, property. Now, the my buddy's uncle bought a new piece of property about 12 miles southwest. And that is another area where we've also had activity. And they move through those two areas this to every three years or so. Yeah, that's what uh, we talked about earlier. Right. And I want to throw this in real quick that, yeah. you know, when, when the Bluff Creek stuff was going on in Northern California through the 19, late 1950s and then up to the time Patterson got his film, the tracks now it was it, sometimes more, but on the general it was about every three years they were finding mm -hmm. stuff there. It wasn't every single year. Um, right. Occasionally, they were consecutive years. But for the most part, it was about every three years. Right. So, you want me to get, uh, keep going? 
Yeah, go right ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So we went, I went down there and um, checked things out, and I found a couple prints that look good. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to blow smoke, uh, you know, at people's butt. Say, uh, yeah, these are 100%, uh, but they looked pretty good. Um, you know, so I decided they were to check out and see if uh, I could develop a pattern this year. Like they, you know, like it's been going on in the past every three years or so. So we went up to the area where he and his family own all the land on that one, one road, you know. Mm -hmm. So we pulled into his parents' house. We were going to start from there, work our way, kind of like a horseshoe pattern through this piece of property and try to work our way to a spring where we had had a lot of activity in the past. So uh, we started to work our way through. Um, we were about a quarter way through and we started to uh, hear some weird stuff going on. Um, you know, we were seeing silhouettes. We weren't quite sure, you know, we didn't jump to the conclusion, you know, it's a big fight, you know, <laughs> you know, we didn't want to uh, jump right there. So, uh, you know, we, we continued our walk nice and slow. And then uh, all of a sudden, Kelly looked at me and he said, did you hear that? And I said, no, what was it? And he described like a, a bass type yell, almost like a human type yell uh, like a grown man would oh that but it carry he said it carried on for a few seconds i didn't hear i was concentrated to something to my left hand side that was rustling around in the brush so we stayed put there for a second um nothing else really happened at that point so we kept moving down this logging road we got about i'd say another quarter mile um and that's when uh I said the right hand side of the logging room on Kelly's side where he was walking. That's when we first saw that that set of eyeballs and that first head pop out behind the tree, kind of stare for a second, pop back in. Uh, that's what, you know, then the adrenaline started, you know, to flow. <laughs> um, and when this thing first did that, I was talking to TW about this today. You know, when they first start to do that, and peek and look at you, they're, they almost get like into a combat prone position almost. Mm -hmm. Where they'll, uh, you know, they'll stay real close to the ground. And that's the sure. thing. This this head and these eyeballs were, were very close to the ground. It, it, you know, no more than two feet. Two feet off mm -hmm. the ground. Uh, but it was a definitive head. It, massive. Massive right. set of eyeballs. Mind? Yeah. <clears throat> what what time of day was this? Well, I'll tell you this much. We had about – we went in there about 8 o'clock, give or take. We had to pick <laughs> Kelly's wife up at 10 o'clock at work. We didn't have much time. So we were going in there looking for the holy grail of sightings. Uh, you were just like going to go said, check the area out. That's correct. We were, you know, really – like we had been talking about, Will and Tom, uh, you know, patterns, developing a pattern. And it's been patterns for years, every three years. They move through this, this area. So, you know, we, were, we had a little bit of time. We thought we'd check it out. So, like I said, we got to that point, and this thing sucked its head out real quick. So, you know, we kind of froze. Right then and there, and uh, this thing continued to do it about four times. After that, it seemed like it, like it almost got on. Uh, it was in a squatting position, and it probably did it three more times. And Kelly said he saw it do another one or two times after that. Um, but he said when he noticed it, the head was uh, almost eye level with us. You know, so I don't know if it was a smaller one or or it was that it's, it's squatting down or on fours maybe and and how far what was it from you do you think 30 yards okay and the you know the the, the moon was good uh i had my headlamp 
uh, Kelly's light had died at this point. <laughs> it was get it was getting very uh, on and off, you know, which uh, made the situation even a uh, little little more interesting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, after after this thing kept sticking its head out, we uh, you know we got up, forced ourselves to walk to walk down that logging road just you know a little bit further mm-hmm. and uh you know we get to these where these two pines are massive massive pines and they're probably uh 10 feet apart maybe if if not less so uh we look and uh there's two silhouette there's two silhouette and uh they're just sitting there staring at us and and we, uh, between the mean light, the, the moonlight, excuse me, the moonlight, um, and what I had on my headlamp was just enough uh, to see the eye shine and uh, and the silhouettes of their bodies. Uh, and you know, it was a stare off between them and us for 10, 15 seconds. And that's what people don't get when I say we were in there an hour and a half or so. We didn't have an hour and a half standoff of these. With right. these creatures. That's that's the total time, you know, when you walk in and the time that's you walk correct. back out. Yes, that's correct. And uh, you know, so we sat there and watched them for a few minutes. Not a few minutes, it was you know, you know what I mean. And this, right. the freaky thing is when they were looking at us, it seemed like the one on his side almost had its eyes focused on me. Mm-hmm. One on my side almost had its eyes focused on him. I could be, you know, that could be imagining that. Sure, but, just your impression, maybe. Correct. But it was something that felt weird, you know, uh, just the way the, the way they were looking at us. You guys, um, were you guys armed at the time? Of course. We, uh, they, you know, be, not uh, not heavily, as we they, usually go. Visible, like, I had my 12-gauge loaded with buckshot. And, and it was visible, right? Oh, of course, it, w- it was visible. Okay, they could see sure. it, and and sure. that'll make a difference too. That's gonna that's sure. gonna alter their behavior. Sure. And I did, uh, you know, T.W. told me he said um, sometimes it's good to rock one in the chamber in front of them. Sure. You know, and uh, when after they after we had that little stare off with them, they all of a sudden uh, we heard some more movement to the left it would have been to our our left of them would have been to their right we heard some rustling they disappeared like right out of the air it was almost like they dropped and those first individuals the first two correct okay. and i don't know if they if the first one the first, that was low to the ground i have i have no idea if that was one of the two that was looking at okay. us you know, so when I I can't really give you an exact number of how many were involved. On my impression, it was at least four of them. You know, uh, I'll tell you something. I always carry a ten million candle power spotlight. Yep. I figure I'm going to burn the fur right off of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like I said, we, we usually we go out very prepared and we go. And, yeah. uh, you know, well, if you're uh, doing just a spot check, though, I mean, and I do spot checks myself yeah. very often. And that's, uh, so, you know, that's all we we plan on doing. And Jeremiah, we were, you're, you're in this horseshoe pattern. Where, whereabouts, are you, whereabouts are you at this point when you we, start to see action? We're about, if you're picturing a horseshoe, we're probably, uh, you know, you picture a horseshoe curves. We're right before that that loop <clears throat> so you know picture we almost came coming or came around a bend you know was it so a switch it a like switch back? surprised them you know Do you want to switch back what's that was it a switch back what do you mean like like if you're going up the hill you know roots will go back snake back and forth to, to climb yeah 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 it okay. was just a it was pretty pretty it's pretty sharp on the logging right. road, you know, that's right. why, that's why I'm describing it as a horseshoe, Okay. you know? And yeah. so when we, we came around, 
that's when that first one popped its head out. So when they disappeared, that's when a larger one came out. And he, we stood up and we, we just, we were staring at this thing in awe, you know, and we started to walk, we, we had that feeling, you know, we need to get out of here, you know, and as we started to walk, this thing started to walk next to us. And I had the idea, I said, I'm going to hit, let's hit the brakes real quick, see what he does. We stopped quick. He did. He whipped around, went in the uh, in the wood line. A little bit. We could hear him thrashing back up the other way. It's almost like he was trying to come around us. Did you, you see know it well I mean? enough to give us a description, or what's that? Did you see it well enough to give us a description? Really, like I said, we had the moonlight pretty good. Um, as far as height, he was a big boy. He was probably pushing nine feet. Yeah. You know, and Kelly described him as, you know, very wide shouldered, you know, just very extremely long arms. The heads, they, they were not conical at our, at all, you know, more of a, more of the roundish. I'm not going to say round, you, sure. you know, you could definitely yeah. tell when it came up, it didn't come to a point. It was more right. of like we a, get plenty, up in a square. Yeah, we, get, we get plenty of variation. Yeah, them. they... And even the one when after he disappeared for a second, I had some noise on my side, and I that's when I got pretty freaked because I had the feeling just something was watching us from my side. And I turned to Kelly and I said, "You know what? I think there's one over here." You know, and lo and behold, I look to my left, and there's another big one, just staring at me and then he popped behind a tree disappeared for a second and that's when we said okay it's time to go and that's uh you know when i racked one in the chamber we turned around and i was walking he was walking forwards on the logging road to watch everything in front of us and we were shoulder to shoulder and i was walking backwards to watch whatever was coming from behind. I had the weapon, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it. Right at that point is when the two, the one on my side, the one on his side, paced us the whole way out. Um, Nathan was asking, there were there were no teeth bearing or vocalizations? No, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, okay. As they, we could hear, they were, it was very clear. I mean, they were, they were probably... 40 yards away from us on each side. Now it's very, I was telling Tom that the canopy is very thick, very thick brush, um, swampy. So we, when we did see them, a glimpse of them on each, when I'd see the one on my side, he'd see the one on his side. They were low to the ground. I could have sworn and he could have sworn that they were on awful. And that's what, uh, that's what really, um, blew my mind because I haven't heard much up here as far as reports with uh, them going down all fours and the build of these yeah. things that we saw the other night contradict what I'm used to hearing. Which, okay, can uh, you describe what you heard? We didn't hear a, a, a str the really strong vocalizations until the end. Okay. So until we got to the edge of the uh, the logging road and back to safety, <laughs> so there, that there, was their send off. <laughs> yeah. So, but when we did get did we get to a clearing, we were on the logging road, and there's small clearings on each side, you know, just like anywhere else, where the brush will clear for a second. And at one point, the one on my side, he stood up for a second. And kind of took a few steps on two feet, turned over, turned his whole torso, looked at me for a second, dropped back down, disappeared back into the brush. And that's when I noticed about 80 yards behind us, there was another one moving in and out of the trees. Not anywhere near as big as these two. Um, had a very, uh, 
athletic build. Kind of like a um, picture a six foot six pro basketball player, maybe mm-hmm. that that kind of build, but a lot thicker. Um, Younger one, maybe. He didn't go down at all. He he stayed he stayed on two legs the whole time. And, Jeremiah, and it was, Jeremiah. Yeah. Were, were you were you able? Will just ask you ask you if you were able to see how well you were able to see these uh, these figures. Could you see any facial features or colors? Yeah, actually, they we were able to see. They were very dark. Whatever, whatever the the lighting wasn't good enough to see exact colors, but I could tell definitely tell the one on my side was dark, maybe a dark dark brown or a black. Um, and Kelly could have sworn the one on his side was like a b- black, but he said he could have sworn he saw some grayish in it. So you did have enough light to at least see those kind of details. The details, yeah. No uh, strong facial features. Um, okay. You could see the hair. So uh, you Nathan's know, asking, how many individuals did you see total? We did two big ones. Uh, we saw the athlete, the really athletically built one behind us. We the one peeking out, uh, real low to the ground behind the trees. That very well could have been one of the other two that was staring at us behind the sure. trees. So I, I so, so least, honest, the same thing. I, I had, I don't know, four, five. Well, sounds like most. sounds like it's, yeah, yeah. It sounds like three, maybe four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking four. Yeah, yeah, probably. Four, because I, you know, like I, when they, oh, it's, did you say something, Tom? They had popped out of the tree at that point. They, they'd been popping out of the trees, and you could see them in the clearing, and you could yeah. see them in the moonlight. Your headlamps weren't working at this point. No, Kelly's light was shot. We, it was okay. a um, one of the ones you plug the eighteen volt battery into the end of it. You know what I mean? It's one of those um, the hell kind of flashlight was it? You know what I'm talking about. It, 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 you got to you put it on the charger. It it's one of the big square batteries. Yeah. Okay. One of those right. Rebita Roboto ones or something, whatever they're called. But that uh, mm-hmm. apparently had him in charge very well, and he had light, but it was very dim, and it was on and off. And my the headlamp I had wasn't the greatest, but the moon the moonlight was is what really you know gave us our best uh, look actually. Sure. Did, you, did you have any any devices to record images or sounds? That you sure, I mean, I we we had our cell phones in our car, but to be honest with you, the, it was the last thing in my mind. You know, you know people and that's don't something get it. you know. People, when, you, when you're in that, yeah, people ask about that. You have yeah, you no don't think about it. Idea, and and I'll tell you, I, I mentioned this once before. You know, now I've done this a yeah, fair number you, of Nate. years, and. <laughs> You know, we were, me and a buddy of mine, Jack, were up in our area number four, you know, where we could expect to see things at any time there because there's a lot of activity there. And I would mentioned a story about, you know, we were heading back to our camp one night about one in the morning, you know, exhausted after a full day trundling all over the mountains up there. And uh, this little year old bear come charging out in front of the, the Yukon and, you know, both of us had video cameras in mm-hmm. our hands. And do you think either one of us got a single picture? Nope. Not a chance. And I'll tell Not you what, chance. as many times as I've seen black bear in that country, I have yes. yet to get a picture of one. Absolutely. Because we, because you're not you're not ready to do it. I mean, it, it no. just it happens and it's so quick before you have a chance to really think about it, they're gone and, and there it is, you know. And these things yeah, are like, totally different. It it we've talked about this several times it sets off a, a different kind of fear in your body it does. it's it's, a, it's, it's a not like fear. seeing a bear <laughs> it's not oh, like no. seeing a deer it, it's totally different uh, you know yeah you're nathan frozen. brought a good point yeah nathan brought up a good point he says if anyone complains about footage i tell them uh to get footage of a mountain lion right on the and money that's exactly the same thing yeah or a bobcat, or yep. there's lots of animals that's, out there that's, that are really tough to get pictures of, yep. you know? We've got a lot of cats up you know, here so right now, and uh, I've yeah, seen one on a trail cats. camera. That's it. 
you know. And, you know, wildlife photographers, you know, they really set themselves up in a position at, at doing a lot of research uh, to know where the animals are to be able to get the really good shots that they get. So it's not something that just a cat person can go out there, you know, pull the camera out of your back pocket, and there's the picture of a Sasquatch. Right. It just doesn't work that way, you know. No, especially it doesn't, when, it doesn't at all. Especially when it's dark out. You know, you're almost, exactly. it's quite dark. You see these yeah. coming out, you, you, see, you see some eye shine, and then poof, a very large right nine-foot feature. I tell you what, I'm, I am more concerned about something grabbing me by the backside than I am yeah, getting a picture of. Yeah, it, you know? <laughs> I'm not a given, tourist at that moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could have given two hoots about audio or picture. Right. You yeah, know, it's next like time after my life's think, in danger. Oh, crap! I wish I could have done that. You know. Yeah, maybe next time my life's in danger, I'll, I'll ask him to pull. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and by yeah, the way, can you get a let off the screen while I like, pull out my phone and record you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey, Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah, yeah. at the point where the where the were there any vocalizations other than you said there was a uh, a grunting noise that sort of kicked all of this off when you started to notice. That's right. Then you saw some eyes down low, some eyes shine, and then yes. were there were there any vocalizations when these big guys popped out? Wait, when he first right before he part, first popped out, there was a deep like a guttural growl. So that's what tipped you off at first. There was something there, right? Or did you see it first? Did I lose everyone? Oh, there's Tom. Oh, I hear you. <laughs> uh, very. Oh, here deep. he comes. Yeah. yeah. Did was what was happened? the was the noise what you heard first that tipped you off? You it was there, or did you actually see it first before the? Yeah. Audio? It, okay. Then it then it made the sound. No, we see. We actually and then actually it made the sound. First. So I, I, we could. What's that? Will? To be honest with you, I don't know if it was him that made the to, sound I'm or trying something. To kind of figure out the one of the ones next yeah, I'm just to him behind. To, him. Trying to figure out the dynamics. We were, of the group uh, dynamics, you know, pretty, what was going our minds on. Were what were they shot, doing? Shot. You know, that's the key thing. Yeah. Exactly. You know. And, you know, when we encountered that other family in our other sure. research spot, and, you know, I'm still considering the fact that it might be the same one, you know, and we've come across, the time we ran into them, and then again, we've never had any hardcore. Video that's before, why, that's why. It always seemed like they were more spread evidence. out. You know, when you can go back and look you know, over an area, you can them. identify individuals by their tracks. That's the telltale thing. You that's know, right. It again, you know, I, I can't hit that enough. Everybody that wants to be Bigfoot hunters, that's you know, right. They they parade footprints around, and without realizing the true importance of them. The importance is identifying individuals because if you can't identify individuals in the area, I mean, we are already that's right at a disadvantage when we're in their location. We are not in control when we're there. They are, and it's extremely important. Uh, even though we can't control sure. the situation, we can react properly to things that happen uh to keep ourselves safe when we're out mm -hmm. there so knowing what's there is right. it goes a long ways to preparing ourselves for being able to react to what they're doing yeah you know and really what i was going to say you know was like this group when we were into them it seemed like they were they well yeah. they were Pretty and much they were and they were probably clustered not, together. They were probably hunting. I know right, I talked to Tim at TW about this, and he had so some ideas. But they were doing. Uh, you know, most of the time he, when they're out at night, they're hunting. That's that's a prime feeding time, especially as a group, because we know again, and I've mentioned this before a couple of times, during a twenty-four hour cycle, part of that time they're hunting as individuals to maximize the caloric intake for themselves. The other part of the time they're hunting as a group. And that's the only time you're going to see them as a group is when they're hunting. So, more than likely, that's what the, what was going on there. Right. And Nick just mentioned a good point. Uh, I, you know, I can't be sure. It's a theory. It's a theory. Right. You know, right. We saw. I saw some cow moose tracks. Um, and we we follow, I followed the tracks mm -hmm. for. You know, she left a she left a pretty good line across the logging road. 
you know, headed well, that's west. That's interesting. And in ground, the, in all ground of a sudden they disappeared. Track should have continued. You know, out of nowhere. Yes. In and, ground you where know, the track should have continued. Excuse me. See, the absence of things is as important as what you are finding. And exactly. then look at the conditions. Why and, did and those tracks kind of finish? Yeah. See, that's very interesting. That's right. Was any of the other area disturbed where they vanished? I mean, you know, so. Was the ground disturbed? Well, was the ground disturbed where the, the, where the, the moose tracks disappeared? Was the squadrons? Okay. Yes. Okay. Not, so there, like, that was so where I was telling you I found. The so you were fairly sure there were Sasquatch tracks there. I could be 100% in the spot where sure, the moose um, tracks disappeared. You know, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. I'm fairly sure. But it's, it's a pretty good I chance. Would, uh, stake my reputation on. Okay. So you know, we, go ahead. we have to pretty link all those pieces I'm together. Sure. You know. Go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Oh, so, you, so you're now you're at the that's top right. of the horseshoe. You had you've had, you've seen eyes shine. You see them down low. You've seen the big yes. guys pop out. And again, were there vocalizations when they were popping? What was happening when they were popping out? All when, like I said, that for the first big guy in Kelly's side popped out, we heard that deep guttural growl. And right after I when we said to him, I think we have one on my side. That's we heard kind of well, I don't want to say it was a whistle, but it was kind of like a screech. And that didn't sound like it came from the one right next to me, though. Well, you guys did you feel bracketed at all in other words behind him. Any kind of noises or visuals on both sides? Okay, so you had that's you had something yeah. on either side. You had something That's what on I'm either saying. side we, and behind. We stayed tight together. And this and this was right on the road. That's correct. Because like okay. I said, I was walking. Day we were on the logging road. Okay. Well, on the me, way out, I was walking back. Here's here's what's probably what was probably so going could, on so there. I could they see. had set up an ambush right on a game trail. Roads are game trails, and people who don't realize that are are fooling themselves because roads, railroad tracks, yeah. High tension line access ways, gas mm -hmm. access line ways, things like that are all game trails. That's why, yeah, right. They're not traveling those. They're on those because path of least and other animals are traveling those. Animals will follow the path of least resistance. So you you disrupted their their For dinner. Sure. So you almost became dinner. <laughs> no, you probably and weren't you know, because you were armed, but the, yeah. <laughs> You probably weren't There's because you guys were, you know, you just happen uh, to be, you're walking to their, their ambush setup. Yeah. And, you know, there's, I think another reason they're so active. And there's a lot in of that game, area. Right? There's a beautiful artesian spring. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Tons of white tail. And, you know, like we get some moves that move through and. Had you found tracks? You know, they aren't quite as big as the moose you guys have out you've there. Been familiar you know, so. with for some time, is that right? Okay, had, for a long time, because you've you're That's familiar great. with it for well enough time. so that you knew that there yep. may have been a trend in terms of movement through the area, right? You're looking for patterns. Were there is, was there a lot of activity in the past Absolutely. around the Artesian Spring? Good question. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's go. uh <laughs> where I had that sighting of that female. Right right in that let me ask she you was, a question. Uh, this she might was right be a little the edge off of in the water actually a bit, but you related an account and, uh, to me that, that Don told you about with the in, with the individual that was in the tree. Yes. Uh that I that one I just can't get out of my mind because uh yep. you know the the and I don't know, Tom, did he tell you about that one? Mm -hmm. uh, Don was it? Yeah. Don was the one that saw the creature, right? Yes, I told. I think I told. They they walked up on this thing. It was up in a tree. Yes, it saw them, saw jumps out of the tree, takes off on all fours, right? And then one of the guys climbs. One of the guys climbs the tree to where the creature was to see you know what, what it was doing. 
and he had a perfect uh, Don, view Dave. of an apartment complex and, and a correct. parking lot. And to me, that's that's very disturbing information. Uh -huh. That's right. And and now tell me how how that's close sinister. That sounds sinister, are right? the areas where you had this stuff happen and where that happened? Yeah, are they are they far apart or is it the same general area? Uh -huh. Oh we yeah, we're we're Don and his. Oh, we're he that that was in. Um, oh, okay, okay. I, I was just wondering if that uh, was we're, anywhere we're near. Good five hours. But away. now you guys, it sounds like yeah. had type. It sounds like you guys had. Oh, here's Don on on two you legs. Got, you just guys the parking had lot, type two. That's what it sounds like okay. to me. Okay, you know with. Because you've you know, been having that's, type, that's what blows my mind. And you've been having I had type never fours taken a report for the anybody most part there, right? That describes them. Well, when you get towards the St. Lawrence Valley, we're in an interesting area because mm -hmm. we're right on the line of the Adirondack Park where we've seen the, the a lot of the type one oh, the you know, Patterson type creatures. Okay. That's what I've taken so most of on in the Adirondacks. Yes. And but when you go toward the St. Lawrence Valley region, you know, I've interviewed right. a lot of elders on the reservation, the Mohawk Reservation, and what okay. they describe is and the type it makes four sense. Right. It makes with, sense. With uh, our body proportions. So now you've yep. got three different yes. types in your um, general area up there. Sounds a, you know, I can't be sure, sure what I saw the other night, but it sounds the, the behavior, yeah, the, like, like you tip, said, sounds like a type two. Yeah, the type ones and the way they were don't built. often go on all fours. They're mostly bipedal, where the twos will go that's as often right. on all fours as they will on two legs. So that's that's kind of that's one of the, you know, that's, one of the yeah. quick visual distinctions. Of course, you know, to know for sure, you got to see their teeth, but. Um, but it's a good clue anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and you weren't you weren't able to see their teeth at any point. Yeah, there? you know. Was it, okay. Yeah, too dark. Yeah. Absolutely not. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Too dark. I mean, mine was built. The one on my side is built different. It had, you know, uh, it was bigger. Right. Thickness. Back to front, burly. As opposed to. The one Kelly saw uh, on yeah. his side was more wide, you know, and that's the thing people don't get. Like, we don't right. we don't all look yeah, the same. And as these humans. things aren't going to be cookie cutters of each other. They're going to be you know, uh, individuals with individual characteristics and differences. So, absolutely, yep. like Nick says, uh, variations. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, sure, you know, and it sometimes it makes you wonder if there's. Subtypes well, you know, my, subtypes. and I and I, I say this because there there's four, you know, five or, or six or so Mr. Blacks. But uh, I was I was chatting with one of the Mr. Blacks yeah. the other day, uh, and that's something I don't know if I told you guys when I when I launched the podcast. He's actually consented to uh, be interviewed for one of the shows for my upcoming podcast. Um, okay, and of course the guy's a wealth of information because they dealt with all that and. Um, it's. Oh, I see. I lost where I was going with. I was thinking I go off in these different directions in my brain. But um, um, what were you talking about? The different types. I, I got lost on a thought. <laughs> yeah. Different type, yeah. But you know, on these. Um, yeah, he was telling me about that they, you know, they knew the four types. That they said there was possibly a fifth type, and there could even be. You know, some and it, and it's kind of localized. I mean, depending on the breeding population and how well yeah. the gene pool gets a chance to mix, if they're isolated, like let's say the type threes. Now, the type threes are very similar to the type fours, and the only difference, really, it seems to be, mm. is is the threes seem to have that elongated ape face, where the twos and ones and fours don't. So it could be that because they're maybe their gene pool is isolated. You know they're they're they've changed enough to become a different subspecies. Yeah, because I'm going to tell you what it, what we ran into the other night. It 
they right. they were apes. Sure. Period. And that that's all I could had on my out of my mind after it reminded me running into a bunch of yeah a bunch of mountain gorillas. And and exactly the and, and you know there was nothing again, human about these things whatsoever. The twos is they are more I guess animalistic if you know for right. a lack of a better term. Uh, mm -hmm. you know so yep. who's calling in here? So so Jer oh, Jer's calling in. Jeremiah and, you know could, could we go back to our to our pro to our progress? Like we're in the at the top you bet. of the horseshoe, sure. We get a couple of these guys that come out that make some noise. You you're feeling a little nervous at this point. And hey Joe, you do hey, a little you doing? You do some testing to see if they're starting to flank you, right? You're 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 playing a little. Bit. Yes, are you able to hear me? Okay, <laughs> Tom. Like, sorry, I lost you. Okay, for a so you. <laughs> these these big tonight. ones have shown themselves to you and you are they didn't care and you're starting they didn't care you're either. starting to feel a little nervous at this point they didn't get two hoots and then and then what do you I do? scared shitless pardon my french okay well like i said we started walking out i uh he looked at me i looked at him and we didn't even say anything. We just got up and we were gone. He, uh, like I said, we were shoulder to shoulder. I had my right, okay. my right shoulder to his right shoulder. He was walking forwards. I was walking backwards to walk to everything behind us. So I had the one to my side. And like I said, every now and then that other one would pop, it was walking in and out of the tree. Feeling. You know, behind a tree, pop out as it was coming, as it was following us. And, you know, finally we got to, you know, back where we had, you know, parked originally. And uh, we were, we wanted out of there. And so finally we get about, I'd say, 50 yards from, you know, the, the truck, the entrance. And um, that's when the one on his side, let out that blood curdling banshee velociraptor scream. Um, and it just you could feel it. Could you see it? It, could just, you see it, it runs right through you. when it was screaming at you. Could you uh, see it? And he, no, they were actually they had actually fell back and let us let us go. At this point, they you know, I couldn't judge the distance, but they were behind us. But still to their side, still to the side to us. Yeah, he and once he once the one on his side did it, the one on my side answered him with uh, with a different type of vocalization. It wasn't high pitch like that. It was more of a low, lower um, cross between a low yell and. Well, it's interesting that something usually <laughs> when one is screech like that, and, that's usually the alpha you know, as a warning or maybe a, all right, we're getting out of here, kind of a, a scream, but mm -hmm. to have a, to have another one right there respond, right. that's pretty interesting. Unless. Oh yeah. I mean, and did, what, what it sounded, you know what it sounded like to us? Well, it was like almost a yeah, victory. Right, scream right. by both of them. And that's not unlike. That's, that's the impression not I got. Unlike what other me. primates do either. You know, especially after a right. successful hunt and, and, or something that like that, they'll, they'll do a lot of that kind of vocalizing. Yeah, and uh, they when we kept walking to walk to the truck, we looked, we turned around, they we saw them mm -hmm. disappear. But the one that had been behind us, which I'm judging, you know, I think yeah, it's maybe possible. a younger and, male. Nathan brought up, you know, you know, what's well, like, what like Nathan, he was Nathan brought up a good point. He said it was interesting <laughs> that they are still using cover and concealment, even though they know you see them. And that could have to do with age and experience. Yeah. You know, because even. Sure. Hey, and that, yeah. that's what I mean. You, the one behind them, sure. it's almost like he was training. Yeah. And, and again, <laughs> no two of these situations then, are going to be identical. You can't you can't say, OK, because this group behaved this no. way that group is going to do the same thing. It's not going to happen. 
that's why it's so critical. And I, and I keep pounding this every time we bring these things up is you have to know as much as you can about individual. You have to identify individual groups and know as much as you can about that group. Now, the one thing we didn't really talk about is sometimes yeah. groups will band together for a period, depending on you know what they do. And, and I know that uh, the largest group I've ever seen, they said had 35 individuals, but they were only together for a very limited time. And then, you know, of course the alphas had their own hierarchy, you know, because these things, you know, they don't, you know, and part of the, you know, we've heard this sure. before with different groups, you know, screaming at each other and, and other primates do this and other animals do this, you know, they'll challenge, they'll see which one is more dominant. And then, you know, the, the one less dominant bows out, lets the other one do what it's going to do. And there's no confrontation. So, uh, the first thing you met you when I, I thought was when you mentioned the, the one screech, then the one, another one made another a loud vocalization, but a different sound. I yeah. thought, well, maybe there were two groups that had bonded together for a time, and that was the two alphas communicating. I, I don't know. I mean, of course, you know, we're just kind of throwing it's we're just kind of throwing the ball around. I mean, you, you can't say because, for sure, but it, it is it is a thought, you know, right? Because you know, I'll tell you, they were both massive, yeah, right. And so, you know, I afterwards I got thinking about it. What was that? It seemed like they both of them were head honchos. Right, exactly. You know what so, I mean? Like which one was the alpha right, out of now, those either two? Either one of them was a sub male, you know, like the number one position after the alpha, or they were two that's what I was two thinking. alphas and there were two groups that had merged temporarily. It's okay. it's again we don't know. I mean, you would have to do some serious yeah long-term research of that particular area and followed that group to see if they split to see if there are two groups in fact right yeah exactly i just want to just address the camera the picture sure. thing for a minute like i said before people that are just joining we didn't go out there to do have or do a research night it we had an hour and a half we were trying to develop a pattern did not Just go out prepared. Just to have a look. We stop and have a look. And, you know, you get surrounded by these apex predators. You're not thinking about whipping out and, the old cell phone. And and I'll tell you picture. what, I, I've done that a thousand times myself. I'll, I'll <laughs> think I'll that. go out for a drive, you know, sometimes. And I'll think, oh, I should go over and have a quick look at this place. Just, just for the hell of it, you know. And, I, and I've got, you know, maybe my shorts and a T-shirt on, you know, and that's it. I don't have anything in the vehicle. And then I think to myself, Jesus, you know, what if I found something up there? I'd really be up shit creek, you know. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it's one of those things you have to, you have to, I guess, be diligent, you know, even on a spot check to have stuff with you. I mean, it's, it's a pain in the backside. But, you know, it, it avoids everybody asking you, well, how come you didn't? Uh, how come he didn't get pictures? How come he didn't do this? Didn't do that? So, you know, I guess like, yeah. Sounds like the behavior was atypical. So, have you ever, yeah, Jeremiah, have you ever had them behave yeah. in that way before? Toward you? No, nope. no, no. Uh, you know, the, the the guy that I know that grew up on that land, the whole family, it's had experiences on that land for years. Yeah. You know, they've had livestock taken. Um, actually, and I told Will not, this not story. Not raped. <laughs> not raped. No, no. I, I, know, I know TW is listening, so I had to, I had to plug that one. <laughs> you, you, right, right. <laughs> He'll make a but, uh, You know, they soon. used to take <laughs> a lot of turkeys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Turkeys from them and a um, couple goats. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a lot of activity over there. And um, they, like I said, every few years they move through there. Yeah. And that's, and, you know, that, and, uh, and that's pretty typical, that kind of behavior. So, you know, now the atypical part of the behavior is the, is the way they act as opposed to say the type ones. And again, that's another one of those things that helps us distinguish one type from the next is behavior because, right. You know, the type one and type two behavior is very different from one another. Uh, the type twos are much yeah. more aggressive. Yeah. And then again, it's going to depend on age and experience, how well they fed, a whole bunch of factors like that. Right. Jeremiah? What, well, you know, 
Uh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. But I was going to say, was there anything else about the area that seemed out of place or unusual to you? You know, when we walked in the, uh, to a certain spot, the there had been a lot of uh, – I never got into the whole tree bending thing. <laughs> I was never a big uh, proponent on that, I guess. But when you start seeing stuff, they, Kelly brought it up. Um, he, in one of our research areas with that other family, and now as far as they go, Will, I, I've always – thought you know seen them as type ones sure yeah uh, that's why i'm i'm having a hard time buying sure. the fact that the same family yeah you you've got it's yeah. throwing you for a loop that now you've got more you got something bigger going on than what you anticipated exactly and every witness report i've taken up there has been the type one yeah you know? and it could be that maybe the twos have just moved into that area could be I mean, again, without really profiling the area, you don't know. And and that's something we're going to try to do is to really get a handle on this everywhere so we kind of have an idea of what's going on where uh, instead of just shooting in the dark. Right. And, uh, you know, the last part about the encounter, when we, uh, you know, we, we turned around, <laughs> we could see uh, that other oh. guy still standing there. And then he disappeared real quick. And through the trees, yeah. the pines were in front of us. There was a stick about four feet long, maybe an inch, inch around. Came whipping through those trees. Landed <laughs> about 10 feet in front of us. And, and that, that could have that. been the sentry. Right. Yeah. And that uh, could have Nate, been the one sure. walking behind us, right? Exactly. Nathan yeah. asked. Um, yeah. Is there one type that is more elusive or sneaky or shy than the other types? Um, I, I would say for that, well, the type. Or, I would say the type four is personally. I was just going to say that. You know, yeah. when the all the natives I've talked to on the reservation say that's what they say they're extremely elusive. Yeah, yeah. more so yeah, than the others they dealt with. So. Yeah, and, and it could be partly because they're smaller. Yes. the other ones are big enough where they're probably not as shy or or afraid of humans as the type fours are because yeah. they're closer in size and build to us yeah you know by far than the other three types are the other three are all the big ones so yes and you know they all describe those type fours as um you know no facial hair and again that goes back to you know the book that i just put out on the minnesota Iceman. i my gut feeling tells me that's what that was it was a type four and people who aren't familiar with the story, exactly. when, when Hanson shot that one, there were three of them there. There wasn't one, there were three. Two of them took off running, the third one charged him. And that's oh. when he shot it and killed it. So, you know, just because of the, the proportions and, and the description, it, it tells me that was a type four, that wasn't the other other three types. Yeah, when I look at, when I'm, I'm reading the book right now, and uh, what... It's described in that book is very, very similar to what I hear when I go on down on the reservation and do research. Yeah, and and I would say definitely that's the most elusive one of the four types. I would agree. Yeah. At least at this point, until we find out more, you know, about if there's other subspecies and such. Yeah. So you know, I mean, it it it, it was pretty uh, humbling. Um, so what did you guys do after you left the area? I mean, <sighs> you guys had uh, had a major underwear changing moment. And, I got when I got, uh, I, I puked when I got back to the truck. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I believe it. You know, um, it was nothing like my other two encounters. They were very quick. Um, yeah, and they intimidated the hell out of me. I still had that that primal fear, but last night sure. was on a or two day the other night was on a different level. Just totally different, you know. And you know, but you know, my feelings are, they if they really wanted us, they could have grabbed us easy. Oh, absolutely. Sure. You know, there's nothing we could have done. That's that doesn't I, mean you're any less afraid in that situation, though. Oh, for without a doubt, I didn't think about that until after. Yeah. You know, um, 
And I, I, I was looking at the size of those big ones. And, you know, I had my 12 gauge loaded up with a triple odd buck. And, you know, I don't even know if that would have been big enough. I'll tell you, I, I know that feeling. I mean, I thought when I encountered the two that I did the first time, you know, that's of all the million things that go through your mind in just milliseconds, one of those was, you know, number one, the 22 I'm holding isn't going to do anything to that. Right. Uh, and secondly, you know, just briefly, my mind thought, well, I could have had my 12 gauge, but I don't know that I would have shot right. that with the 12 gauge either because it probably wouldn't have done much except really piss it off. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, when you see something that size, you realize, holy crap, that you need something a little bit bigger than, <laughs> uh, he says, a 12-gauge slug. I'll tell you what, I had slugs and, and yeah. double-odd buck, and I wouldn't have done anything with anything that small at that closer range. No way. It wouldn't have happened. Nope. You know, you you need, like, remember the movie Jaws? I think mm -hmm. we need a bigger boat. That's what that's where your mind is going in that situation. I need a bigger gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know. I was thinking what would be uh, something they use on Cape Buffalo, or, or uh, they got three seventy five Holland and Holland here. You know, you know, those, like those like old Nick big said, game, African AK, big game. Rifles. Nick said he carries an AK forty seven, and I knew some of the old timers. Uh, there was a guy named Dennis Gates who came down with Renee to Hinden. Uh, after I met, you know, them, they came down again, just the two of them, uh, on the Puyallup scream area. And they first came and picked me up to go up with them. And, uh, I, you know, I hunted with my dad and I, I had a, I hunted with a 300 Savage, you know, mm -hmm. which is basically a 308 round and, yep. and the old man and had a, a seven millimeter. It was a, actually a Japanese army rifle. His okay. brother brought back from world war two. And, you know, we had, we had 30 odd sixes and things like that. So I was familiar with, you know, fairly decent sized rounds. Yeah. He had a, and I want to say it was a 44 mag rifle. Oh, and it yeah. looked Clever like a damn action. elephant gun. Yeah, it looked like a, no, no, this was a bolt. Okay. And it looked like a damn elephant gun sitting between the seats of his Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, hmm. But, but you know, I mean, when you're talking big caliber, you're talking a big animal, you need big caliber. So, yeah. but here again, now what I, what, uh, you know, I know of, uh, you know, with some of the special forces guys that have gone out after these things uh they what the word was it wasn't so much uh the size of the caliber but they put Placement. sheer numbers of rounds no sheer numbers of rounds poured into the creature yeah shock and awe yeah not not even placement just pouring lead into it right and and pretty much that was their solution yeah. uh, they couldn't even pl even placement of a shot was difficult partly i think because they move so fast when they're when they're trying to get away in a situation like that now maybe if you were lucky enough you know to come face to face you know and if you were if you were calm enough to plug them in the eye or something you might take them out yeah. that way but um boy it's a hit and miss deal there you know yeah and i've got i've got a 340 weatherby mag and that's a killer you know right but the problem with that rifle is just to bolt action yeah you better you be know, quick. It, it's accurate. got the firepower to, <laughs> you know, to do some damage. Yeah. But yeah, you know, Nathan to have said full action. fully automatic shotgun. I'd love to have a fully automatic shotgun or one of the semis, you know, with the recoilless. My I looked at one of those at Cabela's a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, I bet the one I take out with is an old um, <laughs> Ithaca my dad used in the state police. And you can, uh, you know, a double clutch in a shotgun is. Um, I don't think so. I don't you think I've keep, heard that. Nowadays, term. you can't do it, but you can. You hold your finger on the trigger, and yeah. you can just rack them out with the pump. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I used to take the plug out of mine so I could put more rounds in it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I do it too. <laughs> Especially with yeah. these anal laws in New York State. You know. Yeah. Well, what Nick says, might as well strap a fifty caliber uh, machine gun on your hip. Yeah, that would do it. That is, you would, you'd never be able to do that. Believe me, I no, qualified no. with a fifty cal in the yeah. army, and uh, you know, people talk, people, you know, have all these fantasies about weapons like that. I'll tell you what, when we qualified, we qualified on an M113 armored personnel carrier. Those things weigh about eleven tons. Yeah, oh a yeah. Browning machine gun would shake the crap out of one of those machines. Let me tell you, rattled rattle bolts loose. <laughs> oh yeah. So that's that's a that's a lot more firepower than people think it is. Sure. 
just answer the oh, question. Oh, I can't hear you, Tom. Lost, lost Tom's audio there. Here, Maya. There yes. he is. Hey, where do you go next? So from here, so what you? Yeah, what's yep. your plan now? What happens? I'm, well, I'm going to give it a few days for my composure to come together. Honestly, I haven't been sleeping. Um, I, the shock is kind of worn off now. I had the adrenaline dump, you know, and it's starting well, to really the... affect me in a different kind of way. Now, see, now your experience is, is very, it's, it's sort of good for us at this point. Yes, because that's the only reason I share it. Instructive. Well, it's instructive for you, but all the teams. Because exactly. it, it really highlights where we need to be in terms of being prepared. Right. And, and it's, it's kind of what I've done. I'm doing with the Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 books, you know, and I, I'm still working on the book I'm working on right now is on searching the areas. I'm getting more detailed as we go, but the, it's really a systematic way to approach this. And like what you did is probably something that a lot of people do that probably shouldn't be done that particular way. Now it's, I I've done it for many years myself doing spot checks, but right. there's, there's really a particular way you have to approach your field work. Right. And part, part of course, you know, the first foundation is being prepared. Yes. And exactly. like I said, I'm not yeah. joking when I, when I carry yeah. a 10 million candle power spotlight and you know, I, I've had, I shine a couple times and use that light on them and, and hope that I blinded the crap out of them yeah. because we were close, <laughs> but exactly. um, you know what it does, something like that is you want to remove any doubt from your own mind when you're out there. Okay, so I agree. having, having, a, having a solid, really good bright light source of light is, is, is a really, a uh, good thing to have, of course. And, you know, it was brought up about GoPros. GoPros, are, I think, are a little spandy, but they are good things to have. So maybe that's something we can we can look at doing once we're able to here is getting the team's GoPros. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that would be great. And then, of course, and then, of course, working your area systematically. And then, like, if you have an encounter like that, going back as soon as possible afterwards and really searching that area because you need to glean every ounce of evidence from that because then when people come out and, and come up with all these questions, you can go right down the list and answer their questions. Yeah. You know, you know and the thing is we went back out there the next day and yeah. the weather has been so funky up here. <clears throat> it had hailed, right. snowed the night after we, the area sure. we, the encounter took place. Totally inaccessible. We couldn't yeah. get to it. And, and I, they know that. That this time of year, it's so oh, sure. hard to navigate through there. Oh, yeah. And I that's, just wish that's I could show people <laughs> how. It's a problem in the winter and spring in the mountains anywhere yeah, in North it's America. It's really difficult this time of year. Oh, excuse me. Especially, I know my area, my favorite areas up here are absolutely inaccessible this time of year. Sure. Because it's really close to the coast, uh, mm -hmm. and the winds blow so hard up there throughout the winter, it takes the Forest Service until the 1st of July to have those roads cleared. Right. I mean, there, there are windfalls every 20 feet for as far as you can see on those roads, and it's virtually impossible to, to navigate them. I mean, unless you're willing to go in there and foot and climb over all kinds of brush and see, you know, take a take a full day to move a hundred yards. That's right. <laughs> we when we went back the next night, it it took us forever to to even navigate a quarter of the way where we were during the encounter. We right, just couldn't do right. it because there it, everything had melted. It, it got it's swampy as it is. And so when you so when you do a report, that's what you want to that's what you want to make sure you note very carefully in a report yes. is um, you know the fact that it was the area the conditions were impossible to get into impossible. and so on, right? Yeah. But it is an area, but it is a place that you can still do follow up you know, without a doubt, very better. easily. Hey, I, I have a quick question to, to Jeremiah and to Will, and that is, um, but Will, in your experience, how quickly should we go to somebody after they've had this experience and do a debrief with them and, as soon as possible. Okay. As well, that, absolutely. Oh. Soon as possible. Now, now Tom, Jeremiah, you're writing the report on this, right? Yeah. Did you feel like that was helpful? Like when we talked quickly afterwards, 
Because yeah. I've noticed, as you, as you mentioned, that both you and Kelly have had some, some deep effects from the adrenal strain. I mean, you're really tired. You've I'm exhausted. Been, I, I, I know that Kelly wasn't even able to maintain he's, any steadiness in his body for hours after that. He's, uh, he's been sleeping all day. He's still in bed. Yeah. Yeah. It, and I'll tell you what, talking about this, and I, I've had this many, many times over the years, you know, people that have had an encounter like this and not even one that serious. Right. Have that effect on them. And when they were able to talk to me about what happened and I was, you know, able to affirm what it was that they saw or heard or did, uh, it was a release. It's sort of, it was like letting go of it. Finally, they were able to, kind of come to terms with it right. and then to move forward. But, you know, people, and I think that's part of why people in communities are so quiet about this stuff. They don't talk about it because the ones that have had those experiences undergo this pressure internally. And then people around them see the effect, even though they may or may not believe what it was they said they saw, but they see enough of a behavioral change that it makes them be quiet as well. Exactly. And that could be that could be something that's going on that we haven't really considered yet, in terms of why communities are so quiet about this. Yeah, I mean, the other area we work near actually, Cali is from that area, and I um, I think I was telling you guys this before. Most of the people that live up there are, live off the grid. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Kelly, he sort of grew up like that, sort of. Um, you know, they so we can we go up there and they won't talk to me, <laughs> you know, but they'll talk to him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. And that's a yeah, great and, area and it too. It depends on how familiar they are with people. You know, right. So. And it's like, when we go to the reservation, they won't talk to anyone else, but they'll talk to me because of my grandma. Sure. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Know? Yeah. And, and that's where it really helps for us to have teams all over the place because, you know, a local is going to get far more information than say one of us from, you know, halfway across the country somewhere. Right. Well, we're just about out of time, fellas. Yeah. So I'm going to mention, um, of course we, we picked up two new teams, one in England and one in Australia today. Nice. Who's doing the one? So, who's running uh, the one in Australia? Uh, Adam, uh, Bushridge. Great guy. Right. Right, yeah, Adam's going to be our, our, our guy there, and uh, Phil Parslow in England. Yep, okay. So that'll be that'll be great to have have those guys on board, and, and I'm working on someone in Norway. I'm hoping they respond, so oh, cool. I've gotten a few few good pieces of information there. Of course, you know, being Norwegian myself, you know, I had a few people contact me from there and <laughs> tell me some things, you know, about the history, you know, with trolls and things there, so... Uh, anyway, that's that's just a little piece of news I wanted to throw out there. And um, uh, everyone, if you haven't checked the website, williamjevening.com, go there. Tom did an awesome job on the mission statement at the very bottom of the main page. Take a look at that. And we're trying to get uh, – we're still working to get everybody's state pages up. So uh, if you haven't done so yet, you know, get the information to the regional leaders or myself or David – and, uh, you know, a, a JRG Gmail with your, your location, whether it's east, west, north, south, whatever part of the state you're in, uh, in that state. And uh, we'll get the pages up. So uh, great job, fellas. Uh, yeah. Good to hear that information, Jeremiah. I'm glad you're able to talk yeah. about that. I am. Well, you know, I was very reluctant to share it. But, uh, you know, I did it for the group and... Sure, and you're and you're you're among brothers here, so you know, exactly. Uh, that's the only reason I did it. And uh, the, you know, you guys a, are the only ones really going to hear about it. That's another plus to this organization. If if you can't talk to anybody else, we can talk to one another. So that's right. Yep. All right, fellas. Well, let's wrap it up for the night then. Uh, okay. Awesome job, and everyone, join us again next week. Have a good Thanks, night, fellas. guys. Bye, fellas. Hey, we will. <laughs>